We are live. Welcome to 2000's The Site Review and Thoughts TV film. Since this movie has probably not been seen by all that many people worldwide, to worldwide compared to many of the other movies I talk about, in the spoiler-filled notes taken before watching section, I am going to try to describe what's in this movie so that it doesn't sound confusing to people who haven't watched it. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. And... I... Right, so, I will not be getting into spoilers for this movie until the thoughts section. And um, if, if I get into any spoiler before that, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. That'll mean I'm done with the spoiler. I feel like maybe those those movies, I just want to clarify, I did not buy, when, when I bought, I bought the first two Jap uh, Chinese, the I, and the Jessica Alba remake of the first one, together. They were only selling them together. I wanted the Chinese ones couldn't find a set that only had so so yeah and so I decided to go ahead and watch the Jessica Alba one and I have thoughts the I, I will be doing video I'll be doing a video I guess maybe two weeks from now or so or hold on two weeks from now I guess is is Batman and anyway weeks from now not next week possibly two weeks from now I'll do a video on the first Chinese one, and I'll do a video on the Jessica Alba remake one. I'm not currently planning on doing a video talking specifically about the, the second one. It's it's a really well-made movie. I'm not saying it's it's not. It's definitely better than the Jessica Alba one. I have reasons. I might go into the reasons when I talk about the first Chinese one. And also, I only I decided that I would put the them up there so that there would be something back there because I really don't have that many of these kinds of movies I only recently realized oh hey I'll be doing you know more than one you know I, yeah at first I was just gonna do the Chinese one the Chinese one the Jessica Alba one and then I realized oh hey the site is actually really sim like all three of them are for all, all of these movies are about a protagonist who can see ghosts. So, anyway. Uh, let's see. Did I really not put... Oh, there it is. Okay, fair enough. Right, so. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers. I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review analysis. This movie did not ruin my life, my childhood, my day, etc. So... Yeah, I don't have a huge amount of experience with this this kind of this this genre. Other than those, I have watched the others and both seasons of One Eight Hundred Missing, which I, I enjoyed. Fine, it's it's kind of funny looking at like season two is hugely different from season one. I get it. It's the second the second season is definitely a lot more like. That's the kind of thing you expected on TV for that kind of thing, on um, you know, back then. But yeah, they're they're both quite enjoyable. It's especially funny to to watch like an episode of the first season close to an episode of the second season. Now, let's see. So, content warning and or trigger warning for kidnapping. Gaslighting, 
murder body horror and uh, yeah that so this movie is rated ages 15 and up at least my dvd in my country i couldn't find other ratings so anyway so is this video that's certainly so so yeah roughly equivalent to an r rating that makes a lot of sense and so yeah now i'm not entirely did i say anyway this this video will also be r rated so this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind the most visual it gets is when i sometimes act something out so feel free to watch something visual like clips from the movie in on the tab i won't mind i'll know but i mean i won't even know of course i'm not spying on you right now i don't have some kind of psychic ability and if i did hypothetically then i wouldn't be you know then i would be taking it just fine that it's on the fritz so I got this movie on sale. So anything negative I say in this video, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out, what it was trying to achieve. So, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands this last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, this is my first viewing of this, and the, let's see. So, that brings us to the plot. Michael Lewis, Andrew McCarthy, is an American architect who is sent to Britain to refurbish an old London hotel where he soon begins to have strange visions and frightening dreams. So yeah, Michael in this has the ability to see the dead. He, he actually inherits the supernatural ability when he accidentally kills the person who had them before. You know, the Santa Claus rules. Before he realizes that the ghosts are real, he thinks that he's seeing things that don't exist, like furries in elementary schools. But he rightly comes to realize that that kind of thing is only found, found inside the minds of paranoid American conservatives, a.k.a. American conservatives, and the mouths of trolls. That's, it's, I, I, my hat comes off. That's pretty decent trolling, getting parents to believe that there are kitty litter boxes in elementary school bathrooms for children who openly identify as furries, who bark, the, the ones who identify as dogs bark at the teacher. That's, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I, I mean, part of that kind of thing is knowing your audience, and they, they knew that they would buy this kind of thing, hook, line, and sinker. So the, th this is partially about Michael trying to figure out what's going like there is there is a a killer in London they they're, they're calling him Jack the Ripper returned even though Jack the Ripper specifically killed prostitutes and this killer targets children so I uh, wow we are I haven't even mentioned Paul W Sanderson's name yet and we're already in like Dude, just do two seconds research. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there aren't really any other famous London serial killers, but it's still like this seems like a pretty huge difference between the anyway. So, yeah, the the this yeah so. As I mentioned, I also watched The Others, which I rate an 8 out of 10. I have not watched The Sixth Sense yes, yet. Yes, I know. And this was also... Yes, yeah, so, so this is somewhat similar to 
Okay, I'm gonna try. El Espinazo del Diablo, or The Devil's Backbone, by Guillermo del Toro, which also is an 8 out of 10 for me. So yeah, the reason I'm doing this obscure 22-year-old TV movie is that I have now watched everything that Paul W. Anderson has written and or directed. It took me a while, but I finally got there. And yeah, it's just like he is... For, for someone who imitates other directors so much, he himself is inimitable. So... I'm personally progressive. I try to empathize with everyone, though if you are causing harm, you need to stop, if, including if that means that the only way to stop your violence if, is for someone to get physical as long as they don't go any further than absolutely necessary. And... Before I start talking about the technical aspects, let me start by saying the people are very talented. I'm not calling into question anyone's skill or enthusiasm. Except maybe Paul W. Anderson. So, the writing. This was written by Paul W. Anderson. And, yeah, so... Yeah, I already mentioned I've, I've watched everything he's written, so I'm just going to briefly go over other than this. He wrote Shopping, Resident Evil, all, all six Resident Evil movies, Alien vs. Predator 1, Death Race 1, and Monster Hunter. And, yeah. Paul makes a lot of Alice in Wonderland references, just like he does in Resident Evil 1. Not much of a payoff in, in either film. Like, it's just, like, he's... He understands that sometimes a movie will make references to another work, but he does not understand why sometimes a movie will make references to another work. Now, yeah, so the writing is basically fine. The I'll, I'll just briefly... The... the yeah, and one of my fellow critics said, The story was good and the screenplay was decent. Some dialogue seemed clunky. That might have been the acting. He's written far, far worse than this. Like, I, I don't know if... Apparently, when he made this, the reason that he made... Like, you know, when you look at Paul W. Anderson, his career doesn't scream TV movie or fail TV pilot. He made this because he was having trouble getting anything else financed because he had, let's see, was it two movies, one or two movies had underperformed. And so he needed something to, to help, you know, yeah, his, his career. And so he made this instead of something, yeah, like... If you know, like, you could watch this without knowing that it was made by Paul W. Anderson, and you'd still be able to tell. If, if you know what to look for, you'll, you'll be able to tell. But, as usual, like, it's decently enough serviceable. Like, I sometimes really, really say very negative things about Paul W. Anderson. I, honestly, at the end of the day... I can't call his work good, but a lot, like, I guess the exception would probably be Resident Evil Retribution, the fifth one, the second to last Resident Evil movie. Other than that, like, his movies, like, they're a decent enough watch. Like, you can sit down and watch one of his movies and be decently entertained. And that's certainly, like, there are directors who can't provide that. So, I, I mean, I've only watched one. You, let's see. It's spelled Yui, but it's apparently pronounced Yu. Yu Bowl. I've only watched one of his movies. The House 
of the dead movie which is like i wasn't asking for much i love the game but you can just it's it's astounding how bad that movie is so i don't, I don't feel like i need to watch more of his work but yeah that's a case where i would say like how do you make zombies boring i, I don't even i think i think you could you could write a phd just like trying to figure out how that movie managed to make zombies boring it's it's one of the most boring hard to watch movies i've ever seen and that really like again with the with the exception of resident evil retribution that gen generally doesn't you, you know i would i wouldn't say that about any other paul w sanderson movie so plot twists yeah, the movie definitely, there are some very awkwardly handled plot twists. There are, there aren't really too many, although I would argue that one of them is, just make, makes things more confusing than there's any reason at all for. Let's see, I guess, I'm not sure I would... Maybe one of the twists is bad, but largely they're they're just they're fine. I wouldn't really say they're too easy to figure out for the viewer. Now one critic said, I figured out the twist pretty quickly, but watching it all unfold is fascinating. So this was also directed by Paul Douglas Anderson, and yeah, so the other movies he's directed are Shopping, Mortal Kombat, Event Horizon, Soldier, Resident Evil 1, 4, 5, and 6, Alien vs. Predator 1, Death Race 1, The Three Musketeers from 2011, and Pom Pompeii and Monster Hunter. And... Yeah, you know, again, you can you could definitely tell that it's Paul W. Anderson. It's it's decent enough. Like occasionally he'll have a really weird idea, and I I don't I don't know if he has like dozens of weird ideas, and most of the time people manage to talk him out of them, or it's just that every so often he has a weird idea and he always puts them in the movie or or somewhere in between. But that's the th like. If at least it had a lot of weird, like, I, the, the, um, another director that is easily, easy to recognize by his work is, ah, it's right on the tip of my tongue, but more realistically, it is definitely on the IMDb app. Let's see, one of it's the guy who did what's it called Isle of Dogs so there it is Isle of Dogs directed by Wes Anderson oh right wow He's, he's one letter off. He's one letter off from W.S. Anderson. So it's, it's, yeah. Usually this would be a, a bad bit. Like I came up with a really ridiculous joke and put it in. No, I swear, I legitimately didn't rem remember that his name was one letter off. Anyway, Wes Anderson, also easy to recognize by his style. And he has you know, kind of, you know, his, his ideas, he has this very particular style. He has many ideas for, for these kind of, you know, like, let's, let's put this in the movie and this and this and this, you know, and that they're very easy to recognize. His movies don't look or feel like very many other directors. I'm, I'm not sure I can think of another director that really reminds me specifically of his his work. But Paul W. Anderson, he'll, 
there there will be a few ideas, but not like not enough to make it like a. Cause there's this. Yeah, I don't. I I guess I won't go into it in in this section. I'll go into it in the spoiler in the first spoiler section. But just yeah, some of the ideas in this. Just if if they were if there were more of them, then it would be like, oh, I see what he's going for. But the fact that there's like just so few of them, you just wonder. Yeah. Anyway, Paul W. Sanderson as a director, I used to enjoy uh, as a filmmaker in general. I used to enjoy his movies with a lot less reservation. I became aware of him around ninety nine. Liked him at the time when Resident Evil Apocalypse first came out. I had fairly few criticism of criticism criticisms of it. Not zero, but fairly few. I never thought that his Alien vs. Predator movie was any good, or this Mortal Kombat movie, and you know the the various others. I think it was with his Three Musketeers movie that I fully accept that he's legitimately not a good filmmaker. He has some technical skill, but he's bad at other aspects of filmmaking. Then there were a few years where I didn't take any enjoyment from his work, The Dark Ages. I think it was as of 2016. I've enjoyed his work whilst acknowledging that his movies are not particularly good, although he has a few good ideas. I did put it here. Every movie of his is watchable, though Resident Evil 5 tests that by being tedious. So, let's see. The, I, right, I made a list, a list of things that Paul W. Anderson very frequently does in movies that I would consider mistakes. I realize not everybody agrees with me on all of these. So let's see. Yeah, his movies are gloriously stupid. Like this, obviously this is not the first movie that has a main character who can see ghosts. I don't know if The Sixth Sense was the first. Oh, actually, yeah, come to think of it. No, because Devil's Backbone came for the sixth sense before yeah anyway I don't know exactly which the first one was I, I we can probably agree the sixth sense normalized the idea you know you can make a movie where the protagonist sees ghosts or one of the see I haven't watched it so I don't know for sure but I think he's supposed maybe one of the protagonist protagonists and anyway the the when you make something like this after that after there's already been the first movie that had that idea that that really normalized that idea obviously you have to do something different i just i'm just not sure this really does what what the yeah now, let's see, so the, yeah, he'll introduce a ton of characters that we think are going to be important, and then they turn out not to be, and let's see, the, under, he under explains important things. And you'll have smart characters who will make big, obvious mistakes. Now, yeah, a lot of this does not really fit the... Yeah, he is a director who does have some fun with the R rating when he gets to work with it. This movie definitely you can you can really tell this was never supposed to be a PG thirteen. You know, before you say, well, it's about a serial killer, of course not. Some of there there are some American movies that somehow get a PG thirteen, even I mean there are PG thirteen American horror movies that are about like I I don't know if any of them are about serial killers, but definitely ones that are about killers. Now yeah, actually, I, I wrote that he makes movies that should go direct to video except for the production value and cast. And in this case, he literally did direct something that 
went on TV. And Yeah, and the, yeah, he'll be a really big fan of a certain element of a piece of media and just grab it and recreate it in his own film, either with no explanation or ridiculous explanation. And yeah, like the, the Alice in Wonderland stuff in this, I don't even know, like, I mean, I guess he was on a, a bit of a kick on that for, because yeah, he made two movies back to back that both have Alice in Wonderland references. I'll grant both of them are made somewhat creepier by it. I would definitely say it works better in Resident Evil than it does here. Now... Yeah, he'll have terrible comic relief with really corny jokes. And that might be more or less. This might be the most straightforward thing. Like, once, like, this really is just the protagonist can see ghosts and he has to solve a murder that that really is like you could you could fairly describe it as that and yeah yeah his movies pass right through you. It doesn't take an eternity, but it's not always especially pleasant. It's not something you feel like doing again really, really soon. That's especially the case with the, you know, most recent of his movies. That He wasn't as bad. Actually, no, I think it's just, it's maybe this particular, this might be the least in a, wait, most inoffensive, the least offensive thing that he's ever directed. I, th yeah, I could understand, like, he must really have thought this was gonna get a series. He doesn't usually, like, this is, this is like Cartman putting on a nice shirt. I, I don't know how to deal with it. Anyway, there will often be at least one third of the movie, and it'll frequently be the last third, that's really fun. You wonder why that couldn't have been the whole movie that was that fun. Let's see. I guess in this movie, I'm not sure I would say there's one particular chunk of this movie that, but yeah. Let's see. His various tropes he shows no restraint with. Yeah, it's definitely like. the the yeah there are some there are some weird ideas in this one anyway i'm going to quote some fellow critics here powerless weird shady and ambivalent this time paul anderson multitasked and directed wrote and produced this tv movie and he did fairly nice at the beginning but somehow along the way he got lost this movie obviously tried to somehow repeat the successful recipe of another famous movie, but of course remained at the effort. I can see dead people. Yeah, sounds familiar. What's the movie's premise? And so Michael must now help some spirits. You complete their unfinished business, move on to the other side. Now. I never found it convincing, the story is pretty lame, and the cast is bland. 
it sure sounded a lot better than the final product ended up. Rather ordinary. That is a very good, yes. Like, you really, this, this should be so much more gripping and compelling. And again, like, this was supposed to be a show. I would say, I'm, I'm not sure there's a single episode of 1-800-MISSING that is not more compelling to watch than this. I, I mean, Anderson hadn't really directed TV stuff before. Maybe he's not good at pacing TV stuff. Which, you know, 1-800-MISSING, I don't have to like it, but it was fairly competent. It got the pacing right. You know, you you watch that thing and it's like, okay, they're definitely expecting an, a commercial break. Let's see, what is it? I want to say every seven minutes, you know. Actually, come to think of it, he's British, so he might not even be used to the whole, you know, every seven minutes of a TV show, there has to be a commercial break thing. So that might be part of why. In, in some ways, this is much less like intense than than a lot of the stuff he does you know yeah a lot of the other stuff he made. And, and I'm you know I'm not just comparing it to the most recent stuff that would be unfair I would say his Mortal Kombat movie is a lot more yeah you know that that grabs you much more at least the first time you watch it kind of a supernatural mystery film in the same line of the others of a sixth sense. Obviously very, very far from both of them, and with a somehow weak plot, but still not a bad film. Creepy first half is undermined by, by a by-the-numbers second half. That is an excellent way to put it. It's not a great film by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a more restrained and thoughtful work than the brain-dead action films that Anderson was about to make his own. It's not the greatest ghost story ever made, but it had potential. And there was some... Uh, yeah, actually, that might be a spoiler. The site undoubtedly owes something to M. Night Shyamalan's huge box office hit, The Sixth Sense, which, if you don't remember, is from 1999. So, literally, like, he rushed out and made his his ripoff just immediately. Like, for, for a lot of his movies, he'll at least wait a little while before he starts, like, just ripping off a, a bunch of... Anyway... And Anderson doesn't shy away from showing off his many influences, as well as Shyamalan's film, the site marked the beginning of Anderson's obsession with Alice in Wonderland. And and visual references. Uh, yeah, there are also hints here and there of Mario Baba, particularly of his own. Kill Baby Kill, which also featured a ghostly little girl. There's a shot that recalls the moment when Carl's Carswell leaves the British Library reading room in Night of the Demon from 1958. The performances are mostly strong, the plot is intriguing, and twists and turns satisfyingly in the final act. And overall, the site isn't anywhere near as awful as it's often painted to be. It's not a great film by any stretch of the imagination, but it's more, uh, yeah. There are some nicely disturbing moments. Paul W. Anderson had, in the late 1990s, been making a name for himself in Hollywood following his debut film Shopping from 1994, but his career was about to hit a considerable bump in the road. Computer game adaptation Mortal Kombat had been a huge hit, but the British-American co-production Event Horizon failed to match that film's success. The big-budget soldier was a full-on financial disaster, and Anderson's standing in Tinseltown took a serious hit. He took a year off to regroup, lick his wounds, before returning to the UK 
for this pilot to a proposed series that never got made, leaving behind this patchy but intriguing pilot. The site offers a bit of a strange mixture of mystery, thriller, horror, and a touch of comedy, but somehow it works quite well, pretty stylish too, maybe nothing too special in general, and it feels a bit too artificial at times. The movie didn't really didn't seem to flow. It was kind of tumbling around, then finally got to a point which was a pretty good twist. Make the movie worthwhile. However, there are some rough times getting to the end. It's a great pilot, really good style. It was a nice marriage of the traditional British mystery, a bit of quirky, edgy American sci-fi. The opening does a pretty good job telling us what this is going to be like. It's not a spoiler to say literally the first thing we see is one of Michael's nightmares about someone who's dead that he now has to help. Now I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. I will say the very, very ending does not really fit with what came before. It It is a very... I'm not going to talk about it in, in details right now, but... Probably, let's see, the, the ending of the notes taken while watching section. I'll, I'll talk about it some. It's hard to... let's see, this is, this is where I usually go into... Am I happy with how the movie ends? I mean, obviously, I don't love that it is a failed pilot. You know, that kind of... I, I don't really have to spell out for you. That means that if we like what we see, then, you know, it's frustrating that we'll never get to see more of it. But the, I, I guess what I will say is, if this had been a show, I think I would have given it a chance. I think I would have given it maybe half a dozen, full dozen episodes to see. I mean, honestly, considering that he did get to make movies afterwards... You know, I'm not sure he would have kept working on this show. He would, like, you know, not not everybody does, as, as far as I know. I'm pretty sure there are some shows where, you know, someone created it and then someone else took over, like, show running duty. Yeah, yeah, like, every so often, J.J. Abrams will start a show and then leave someone else to, to, to be showrunner for him. So, you know... As, as long as I felt fairly confident that someone who was much better at it than Paul W. Anderson would take over, yeah, I've, I would have given it half a dozen to a full dozen episodes, and if I was still interested by then, I would probably have kept watching even if it started to get bad. That is, yeah. But, yeah, I can't really claim that I'm... I'm intrigued by how the movie ends. Let's go with that. And yeah, so there's definitely some convenient writing in the the ending of this movie. That is without a doubt. Yeah. So, yeah, let's see the Yeah, so the, yeah, this is where I would go in, where, where I go into, does the movie lose your interest along the way? I mean, I've already quoted critics saying it, yeah, the, the second half definitely, like the first half, you're trying to get your bearings, like Michael is, you're trying to figure out what's going on, you know, I mean, Okay, so if you know anything about the movie, one of the first things you'll know, you'll find out about this movie is he can see the dead, you know, so that we know that. But 
seeing him come to terms with it isn't boring. You know, it easily could be. There, there are movies where, you know, even even if you don't know what's going to happen going in, you're still bored. But no, it, it was it was perfectly decent. You know, the, this kind of supernatural horror mystery kind of thing. It, it worked fine with the, the creepy imagery and, and such. Now... So the yeah, so this is one of these movies. Yeah, so yeah, moving on to characters. This is one of those movies where it simply isn't going to tell you all that much about at least some of the characters, and one or more of the characters. There are aspects to them that make them harder to like. So yeah, Andrew McCarthy as Michael Lewis. I mean, let's see, he was in both Weekend at Bernie's movies. He was in St. Elmo's Fire, Year of the Gun, and Mulholland Falls. Those are the other movies that I've seen him in. Yeah, I mean, he's he's fine. I don't I don't remember him in all those movies, but I he was probably fine. He was he was fine in this. Like I don't. I wouldn't necessarily have minded like his his performance for for a lot of episodes. I, th I think he should probably get a little bit more. I, th I think that might be also be Paul W. Anderson. Like he gets weird performances out of his his cast sometimes. Like I I really don't think I've ever seen another director make Mila Jovovich boring. And it's especially weird because they've they've been married for a long time now, and he consistent like even in Monster Hunter, like yeah, I I think all the movies that he puts her in, she's he, he ends up making her boring, and I've never seen anybody else do that with Mila Jovovich, like it, yeah. Did I say he puts her in? I, I don't mean to imply that she doesn't earn it. I'm sure... I, I personally have always really liked her in action movies. And she's underrated as a dramatic actress. She's just... There are a lot of movies that don't serve... That, that do her a disservice. You know, that don't show how good of an actress she is. Now... So, let's see... Jessica Oyelowo as Isabel, who actually did appear in 2010's Alice in Wonderland. Woman with large poitrine in Red Queen Court. So not a big role then. Yeah, that... She actually did end up... So the movie was prophetic. She, you know, one of the major actors in it ended up appearing in an Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Oh, she played Princess Margaret in Churchill the Hollywood Years. Wow. Yeah. And Sarah in Sleepy Hollow. Sarah. Is that the... The maid, maybe? Maiden girl, I guess. And... I th yeah, I believe this is a critic who wrote this. The little girl, Alice Michaela Dicker, who would return as the embodiment of the Red Queen computer in Anderson's subsequent Resident Evil, was a victim of the kill. Oh, actually, that might be from Wikipedia then, right. That's right. That's hence, hence the Alice in Wonderland references, because one of the killed kids is named Alice. But yeah, she's, she's so good in... Resident Evil as the, you know, that's again, like, clearly he knows how to do creepy, right? It's, he can get it right. He, he can do that not, not only on accident. Now, right, so, quoting fellow critics, 
The acting is at the expected levels and a bit dull despite their efforts to create an agonizing and scary impression. The acting was awful. There wasn't a good actor be f to be found in the whole film. I think Isabella was pretty good. Now, when Andrew McCarthy is the best actor of the bunch, I mean Andrew McCarthy, this guy, helped make movies like Less Than Zero, Less Than Zero. The guy can't act his way out of a wet paper sack. Some of the British cops managed to do a worse job. What really makes it are the characters. The characters are fun. You want to know more about the ghosts. You just know they have a backstory that's waiting to be revealed in other episodes. It's really a shame that's all there is. So, yeah, the dialogue. Again, quoting film critics. The dialogue is nothing special, and it's rather dramatic, but at least there are a few funny lines that make this half-interesting movie almost fun to watch. The killings are random. I don't buy that. I'm not selling it. So, this... Yeah, the cinematography was handled by DP David Johnson. And... So let's see, yeah, the, he's done some music videos after this, he, okay, yeah, so he DP'd Resident Evil Extinction, that would, that's the third one, Alien vs. Predator 1, Resident Evil 1, so yeah, he's, he's, he and, Paul kept working together after this one. So somehow... No, seriously, he, he does a pretty decent job. Although, like, if you... If you start to watch this, let me assure you, the shaky cam at the very start of the film, that calms down, like, a lot. Like, I want to say maybe... 10 minutes in and onwards, there's way, way less shaky cam. Like, as wild as he goes with it in more recent movies, at this point, Paul W. Anderson did not go completely off the wall with, with shaky cam. Now, some of the time it definitely is easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes, and there are... It's really only the start of the movie where there's hyperactive cinematography when it should be calm. Now, so quoting fellow critics, with those kinds of influences, you might expect the site to look stylish, and it certainly does, thanks in no small part to director of photography David Johnson's excellent photography. His lighting of the rundown interiors of the hotel is particularly striking, and a shimmering effect used to suggest loses visions done by shooting into a vibrating mirror is memorably striking. Less impressive are the opening scenes set in New York where Anderson and Johnson use tight close-ups and jittery handheld camera work in an effort to disguise the fact, not too convincingly, that they never actually went anywhere near the Big Apple. The consistently filtered lighting got annoying after a while. I longed for a single bright color and some of the other effects were overused, but the cinematography did appear unique. Cinematography was exceptional for a TV movie and was largely responsible for the eerie feel of the film. Absolutely correct, yes. The cinematography did add to the eerie feeling and helped create suspense, although a bit overly used at times. The waviness of the first, very first scene in the film started to get on my nerves very quickly. That wasn't a good sign for being the first few minutes of the movie. All in all, however, the style in which this was filmed really did add to the en enjoyment of the movie. The lighting was appropriate, the camera style fit the story, and staging was good. The movie really keeps up your curiosity. And the editing was handled by David Gamble, who has nine TV credits and seven movies. 
and let's see. yeah, so quoting fellow critics, some bad editing in the first half of the film, which I think has something to do with the fact that it's a TV movie. Yeah, I know about the fade outs, and that's not what I mean about bad editing. The editing and the feel of the movie changes and becomes a more than average movie, filling you with a taste for more and finally explodes in your face with a uh, yeah. I like this movie. It feels like a light version of something Clive Barker would write. And I hope that a sequel will be made and Paul Anderson keeps on doing what he's so good at, creating a good story. Clive Barker. Maybe, yeah. Kind of, some, somewhat. So the special effects, there's some, there's some really dodgy CGI. And I'm not... I'm not criticizing the movie for having for you know having a low budget to do CGI. It's it's a TV movie. I'm criticizing the movie for choosing to use way too much CGI. And there's not there's not a huge amount of it, but there are like these brief bits that really rely on the CG and the CGI cannot pull that load. It cannot carry that load. There's some pretty decent stunt work. And according to the critic, the London scenery with its Baroque like architecture buildings is beautiful, dark, mysterious, and add tension to the overall atmosphere along with the creepy music. The Arcadia Hotel, played by then the then dilapidated Midland Grand Hotel in Central London, since renovated and reopened as the St. Pancras Renaissance London Hotel. The hotel is incredibly creepy and foreboding. They did a really good job on that. <clears throat> that brings us to the next section the score. So this was handled by Jocelyn Puck, who did 20 movies and 9 TV, or has done, and 9 TV credits. It was maybe a, a bit average and kind of, what's the word? I'm not sure I would use the word original, for example, but it got the job done. I don't think there was really any time where the movie the, the music didn't work. Now. So the pacing. Now having watched every single one of his movies, I can say Paul W. Sanderson always has uneven pacing. Like, he is not... He has not yet learned. It is possible he will in the future. How to properly pace movies. Like the the just yeah. This is an hour twenty-five and a half minutes long without end credits. And an hour and twenty-six minutes long with them. So yeah, very, very short ending credits. I'm not sure I would really say it's quite worth the investment of time. Honestly, if you start to watch this, if at some point you start to just feel kind of bored by it, you should probably just stop watching it. I I would say you're unlikely to find that it gets more interesting down the line. Once it starts getting boring, it, it just kind of stays boring for a really long time. For me, I guess the rest of it. Yeah, if if you want a more act or a more specific, I would say watch the first half and then just make up your own ending. the The ending of this movie is not gonna like leave your jaw on the floor. It's it's fine. It's perfectly serviceable, but it is not some kind of great. Yeah. So the best element of this 
it's legitimately kind of interesting seeing Paul W. Anderson do his thing in something that's supposed to lead to a series. Like, other than it, his Resident Evil movies, let me think. I'm, I'm fairly certain. Yes, yes, I read once that despite the sequel Baby Endings of his Mortal Kombat movie and his Alien vs. Predator movie, he didn't actually want there to be sequels made to those two movies, which might be part of why he didn't have anything to do with the sequels to either of those movies. I, I know. I, I, I'm still trying to process that too, and I read that years ago. He legitimately did not want there to be sequels. He just thought it would be cool to, to end them like that. You know, Resident Evil was the only time where he thought that there should be a sequel. And... And then he did this. You know, he or he also did this. Which was supposed to lead to a an ongoing TV series. So yeah, that, that is just... yeah. And the worst aspect is also the Paul W. Sanderson aspect. Just, yeah, I, I I can't help but be fascinated by him, but I cannot claim that his movies turn out particularly good. Now, let's see, what was I most worried about? I was kind of thinking that this would like I was I was surprised by how like a lot of this does stand on its own like a lot of this you can just leave you know you, you don't need follow-ups and the thing I was most looking forward to was also the Paul W. Sanderson style the I only found one trailer. It definitely did give too much away, but it also gave you gave you a good idea of what the movie is like. So if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. You know, if, if you go, you know, search right here on Google, go to the, you know, just, yeah, search for the site trailer, the top, currently, when I last did a couple of hours ago, the top hit just is called the site and it's like two minutes ten seconds that's the trailer it's really bad quality but that is the trailer it's also on the DVD and yeah the cover and poster do not give away too much but do give you a good idea of what the movie is like now it's been a little while since I talked about but yeah I think it makes sense for this I have I have a section in my notes called should this just have been a music video an episode of the Twilight Zone Outer Limits or something else in general is this the wrong medium for this story why which medium would it fit for if any or is it good for its medium, but it would also be good for another medium? I think it would have made a lot of sense for this to be a music video or an episode of Twilight Zone. That that would have been very, like, as a, I, I get why the, it was supposed to lead to a long-running series instead of just being one episode, but other than that it would have made a lot of sense as just one episode not as as something that wasn't supposed to be followed up on on rotten tomatoes this doesn't have the there are, there are no reviews but the audience score is 35% based on over 500 ratings and the yeah the average rating was 3.1 out of 5 
it's not on Metacritic. And on IMDb, it has a 5.9 out of 10. There are only 42 user reviews. So I read all of them since there's so few. And there are seven links in IMDb's external reviews section, and only one of them both worked and were in a language I speak. So, yeah. Only 1,607 IMDb users have even voted on this. And let's see, 19.7% gave it a, a 6. 18.5 gave it a 10, 15.7 gave it a 7, 14.3 gave it a 5, and 10.9 gave it an 8. Yeah. So the DVD that I have has, you know, the only thing it has are the, you know, there's a trailer for this and I want to say four other trailers. You know, this was back when that was, you know, when, when DVDs could just come with trailers and people would, you know, the, yeah, to, today we kind of expect more, although I'm not surprised that this doesn't have, yeah. I rate this five psychic abilities that come in handy out of ten. And that brings us to the spoiler section, the thoughts section. So the rest of the video will contain spoilers and the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MSC3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right of this is thoughts I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary or live tweeting or the like. And the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. So, thoughts. Notes, notes taken while watching. Not a bad opening nightmare, although I know they're building tension, but could that kid have been any slower to look up at the guy? Okay, so Michael wakes up shocked, but I think the cameraman is even more scared than he is with how he's shaking the camera. Thank goodness the camera calmed down once he went to London. Michael sits recording a message at his desk, and oh, great! The ghost from The Shining lost his bowl again. I know it's necessary to get the plot going that he runs over the old lady, but if you're looking at photos while driving, you're pretty much asking to get in an accident. Be strong, and it's the night the lights went out in London, apparently. I guess all the people just standing there looking at the, you know, Michael and, and the old lady are ghosts. I mean, I guess they don't have anywhere else to be. They have enough time to just stand around. They close the door in the police station and there is a cross right over the no smoking sign. I agree. Do not smoke, Jesus. Michael gets in the elevator. The door is closed. He sees someone... Now, they didn't even do a reaction shot for Michael. I mean, I guess he just doesn't really care. I mean, he has seen a lot of weird things recently. After a while, he's just like, fine, there's a creepy guy standing right in front of me as the doors close, whatever. And it's just, you didn't have to edit that guy in. Like, you could have just had him walk into the... I, maybe that's what one of the critics was saying about bad editing. You could literally just have had the you just have Michael turn away from the camera, walk into the the elevator, the doors start to close, 
cut to the next scene. But when you show the guy looking intently at Michael, that kind of says to us that Michael can see him, that that's why that, that whole, and when we don't have a shot of Michael's reaction, but that is, a, Paul Davis Anderson does do that. He'll, he'll show the audience something that seems significant, but none of the characters realize, so it's like, okay, I guess, I mean, thank you? I, I, I mean, I don't personally, I don't think it's automatically a bad thing to give the audience information that the characters don't have, but Paul, it, it often won't lead to anything. It'll just be, you know, the, it'll just be there. The ghosts left 21 messages? I mean... I, I don't know, I guess I just feel like, couldn't they just, like, call once and just hand, each of them hands the phone over to the next one? Anyway, I do appreciate that he did go to the cops with his messed up apartment 21 ghost messages. Michael sums up, sums up what's happened so far and ends with, things are going well. Okay, I really hope he was being sarcastic. I honestly can't tell with his performance because if things usually go even worse for him, holy crap. And Michael Chase is after the guy who keeps calling him a murderer, gets hit by a car. So far this movie is 70% Michael seeing things and people that aren't there and getting involved in car accidents. How come I get the basement? Because it's almost as creepy as you are? So the, the box that Michael gets is labeled Curious, and the letter is labeled Curiouser. It's getting curious and curiouser. Wow. And, you know, there's a Alice in Wonderland window, so, yeah, intentional reference. Michael walks up to the door, key in hand. I don't know, I just feel like some creepy mouth log should remain locked. You, you might not like what you find in that mouth. Through that mouth? Okay, fair enough. I cracked up when the camera revealed that we weren't just hearing her reading aloud the letter because he was reading it and she wrote it. She actually was there reading it to him. That, I, you got me. That was, that was funny. Now I have to spend forever with my ass hanging out. Are you okay, Paul? I mean, you will direct movies that are well received after this. By your standards, at least. The children were playing football after they died. At this point, I kind of feel like someone dared Paul W. Anderson to put as many ghosts in the movie as at all possible. I mean, I'll grant it's a little creepy when we realize, oh, the you know they were ghosts this whole time. But like, why? So this is just a thing. Like once they're dead, they'll just. They'll just play in a way that isn't creepy. See, that's the... Th I think Paul realized that sometimes ghost children playing is creepy. So he thought that if he puts as many ghost children playing in the movie as at all possible... Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration That all of them will be creepy, but it's not that creepy. They're just running around playing football. Like... What's the big deal? Like, you know, near the end, you realize, oh, they were ghosts this whole time. I forget, did they fade out of sight? I think they might have. And it's like, and, and like, when we, when it's confirmed for sure that that lawyer guy was dead, he shows, oh yeah, I was shot right here. Here's my bloody wound. I mean, with most of these, we don't actually see the wound that, like, I'm, I'm not asking for it, especially not considering a lot of them are children, you don't, you know, I just, it just feels a little weird to me, like, are all of them hiding it, hiding their wounds with their clothing, and I mean, if, wait, but she said that she died while wearing the gown from the hospital, and now she's gonna spend forever like that, does that mean that the kids he sees as ghosts 
were wearing those exact clothes and there was no blood on the clothes when they died? Like, he just, he really doesn't think this stuff through. And I wouldn't even be asking these questions if he just hadn't shown the wound on that one guy. I kind of just assumed, okay, this is a world where when you die, you, you know, you, you basically look fine, you know. I'll, I'll definitely, 100%, the, the, Alice, she was creepy. They, they did some really great creepy stuff with her. And some of the time it was, you know, we were seeing her play and, yeah, they, they made her effectively creepy, for sure. Jake, things might get a little weird. Not as weird as you, but weird. Michael thought the guy on the stairs was a ghost. That's mildly amusing. Not a fan of the homophobia expressed. It took a long time for Michael to realize that Isabel was another ghost. Like, once once they're both in the elevator, like, I get maybe that's why he thought the guy on the stairs was a ghost. That was supposed to be, like, no, 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 not everybody's a ghost. Like, Isabel, like, I immediately said, okay, she's definitely a ghost. It was a decent enough shot. Like, when you see it, he's looking, like, it's a, it's a, they're in an elevator. And there are mirrors on all sides. And the camera is placed so you can tell that she's standing right next to him. But when he looks in the mirror, he can't see her. So that's that's a... Yeah, I, I like that as a little... And it's also... I mean, I guess they shot it twice. Once where he is alone. But they had to place the camera so that the camera isn't caught. By the reflection. And then they shot it once where she is standing next to him. And then they combined. Yeah. Impressive. 21 ghosts. I guess if they got a full season. They were going to have him deal with one ghost per episode. Wait to see what tomorrow brings. I can't wait to see what tomorrow brings. So I guess this was supposed to become the recap at the start of episodes. There's something about this place, this particular spot. Is your architect sense tingling? To be fair, they do actually acknowledge you know, he's an amateur. Which, what was his name? Caleb? Kleb? Something kept calling him. I guess I just find it a little weird that according to this movie, apparently children spend their time in the afterlife equally divided between running around playing and going around being creepy at people who can see them. And someone takes Michael's picture at the funeral, but it's like the, the, uh, what's it called? The surveillance. Did I miss something? When did the guy who clay become a permanent fixture last i saw michael was chasing him down is there a deleted scene that explains this michael starts talking to the ghost in the subway car creeping out the woman making her walk away and it's only after the woman walks away that the ghost responds anyway okay so the old buildings were destroyed by the bombings during the second world war ii and the killings were near those buildings because children would play there so the killer could get to them. Yeah. I said that. I guess all 21 ghosts are there watching. Man, working for ghosts is grueling. You never know when they're watching you. So the killer is a copycat copying off killings in World War II. It's kind of weird that Isabel thinks that Michael is trying to look up her skirt, calling him, I want to say, Peeper, maybe Peeker. Like, if there were 
if there were five more of those kind of weird ideas in the movie, then it'd be like, he's, you know, now he's cooking with all, that's, here we go. But it's just like, there's, there aren't that many of them. Like, the idea that he would be trying to look up a ghost's skirt is just like, I'm not sure I've seen that in, a, in any other movie. You know, that's, I mean, I, I feel like, she dealt with that when she was alive. Now that she's a ghost, like maybe it's difficult for her to to stop thinking of guys looking at her. Yeah, yeah. It's if if just if there was just more of that, then it would really work. And there's the point that you know, in England, the police don't carry guns normally. 99% of these cases, the killer communicates with the press or the police. That has to be an exaggeration. Why didn't they just have her say the majority? The close range fight between Michael and the killer is fine. And, you know, it looks as like they think Michael is the killer. I saw someone say, you know, he was only, he hasn't been in London for long enough, but, you know, someone points to, you know, the, the Asian woman selling stuff at the start of the movie. Specifically, yeah, what's the word? She she said something like, you're going to London again. You know, he, he goes there every so often. I don't think Michael being accused has to not work. I think the reason it doesn't, the fact that Michael was recently in a physical fight with someone would be easy to discover for any doctor, and he would have seen a doctor since he was knocked out. When the police find someone who's unconscious, they have a doctor check him, and a doctor can tell if another person hit them, or if they themselves, like, hit, you know, like, I get it. If the cops didn't have a doctor check him, they'd be like, oh, those bruises, that's just, you know, you, you hit your, you intentionally hit your head against a wall or something to convince us that you were attacked. But no, they had, they must have had a doctor. He's, he's in a hospital bed, you know, like it would be one thing if they came, if cops came to find him and he woke up still down there and they were like, oh, he must be the killer and he got himself hurt to, but by the time they're talking to him, as we see in the movie, he must have been checked by a doctor. Yeah, it's just... And it, you didn't have to have such a big plot hole. And... Yeah, we see the, the real lawyer walks into the, the cell and... Apparently Michael is still getting used to the idea that he can see dead people. So the actual lawyer killed the other one. That's, I mean, okay. I mean, that does happen, I'm sure. You know, he specifically says, oh, the, the you know, he wanted, he, we were partners. He wanted the money or something like that. You know, so he, he shot, the lawyer that Michael has now seen, like, what, three times, I guess? And then he burned the building down, which is why it, excuse me, seemed so creepy when they were there. But then nothing actually happens to the guy. I, I, yeah. I can't stand by while you destroy your career. Then help me. Help you destroy your career. Wow. Some of this dialogue. I didn't hate the twist that the copycat killer was kidnapped by Mace. If we're angry enough, we can affect the real world. Okay, now I'm confused. Are they ghosts or are they toxic fans on social media?
and yeah, so we find, you know, at first, yeah, it turns out the killer is one of the two old cops. We think it's one of them, it turns out to be the other one. I'm not entirely sure how he resisted the urge to kill for so many years, or did something happen recently that set him off? I feel like that should be the case, and that would, like, you could, you could easily have something. most beautiful blue eyes so the moment that the audience finds out or in this case thinks that he's a serial killer he becomes creepy to other characters and Mills shows up and knocks out Price turns out he is the killer another fight between Michael and the killer only this time we know who the killer is and he has a knife for some of it I didn't come alone and he sees the dead and dies is the implication supposed to be that they focused so hard that they pushed him and thus killed him or just like he got spooked and backed up so the ending really just feels like it's setting up a completely different show it is kind of cool that the guy seen here at the end is Jason Isaacs who for a while appeared in everything that Paul W. Sanderson did and then never again. Like I, I'm not sure. I'm I'm guessing they had a falling out or something. But yeah, I don't know. I guess it wasn't going to be him tracking down serial killers or even just non-serial killers. From from this point out, I mean, here at the end, he's not dreaming about dead people that he might be able to help. Like he has been up to this point, he's seeing some kind of a post-apocalyptic and yeah some kind of apocalyptic event that hits New York and yeah I agree with those to say it's super creepy that they put that imagery there complete with broken twin towers in something that came out before 9-11 yeah like the this last bit like I don't it's like you didn't have to have anything there you could have just ended it with the killer being arrested and then cut to credits and then we would assume, okay, so next week it's another killer. It might not be a serial killer, but another killer or something. Now, for a chunk of this movie, I had a hard time putting my finger on what was bugging me about the depiction of seeing ghosts in this movie. But now I can put words to it. I think the movie should have chosen between the idea of him being able to see ghosts all the time if they're around, and then the kind of seeing ghosts where every once in a while a ghost will appear to you the mix in this is really awkward especially when we learn at the very end that the ghost if the ghosts focus hard enough they're able to affect the real world in that case at least one of them should have been going around with him all the time I think most of the time at least one did but then a bunch of the time you know it would be one of these annoying ones that would go play hide and seek with him instead of actually helping him like I don't even know why the ghosts playing football why are they just playing foot like hypothetically if this kid knows he's a ghost knows there are people who see ghosts why wouldn't he be trying to make sure that the people who can see ghosts know that they can see ghosts so they can help the ghosts like, it makes no sense for him to just start playing. Actually, come to think of it, he's like 10. Football probably is the priority. Okay, so by the ending, there is still no resolution to the fact that according to the dead lawyer, Michael's lawyer in this is a killer. I mean, they just bring it up and then don't do anything. I feel like there should at least have been a line. Like, and this is, again, like, if that kind of joke showed up in a Monty Python bit, that would be fine. You can do that there. But this is a serious story about, like, oh, you know, not the most serious in the world. It's about ghosts. But, it like, the primary focus of this movie is him trying to track down a serial killer. And they just casually bring up, oh, by the way, the lawyer, he's killed someone. He's committed insurance fraud, I think. They're not going to do anything with that. Just nothing anyway that brings us to the final section notes taken before watching
Now, yeah, just briefly, the movie does not appear to have empathy for the killer himself. And I think that works fine for it. Now, let's see. So I guess, yeah, I'll just really briefly try to go over the, the basic plot for those who, you know, in case you haven't watched this and maybe don't even have a chance to, and you do want to know the basic plot. So basically, Michael is an architect. He... At the start of the movie, he lives in New York, and he moves to London, where he's going to renovate this old hotel. But when he gets, you know, at, even before he leaves New York, he's having these dreams of, like, you know, the ch children being kidnapped and murdered. And when he gets to London and sees the place, you know, he's... He, there, there's this ghost that appears in a mirror and so he chases it and I don't even remember I don't think anything came of that actually and then he like he talks to this let's see it, right yeah he takes some some pictures in the hotel and oh that's right right he chases the little girl and he f comes upon the night security guard, the, the night watch. Yeah. And so, you know, later he's, he's leaving the hotel. He goes through, he's, yeah, he's driving down. He, he gets these pictures that he took and he's looking through them while driving, which is just asking to get into the car accident. Like I said earlier, he hits this old woman. I don't remember her character's name right now, but she seems convinced that it's going to kill her. And he's like, he talks about, oh, it's the ambulance will get here, you'll be fine. But she does die, and she had the psychic ability before, and now he's going to get them. She, she talks about, like, she's, she's so tired, she can't go on anymore. And I, I just, I don't understand why he had those dreams before even meeting her at all. Wait, no. Actually, I think it was something like that he had the gift before. He he always had the gift, but she had like she was she was really really good with it. it I think it's kind of like like if you don't know how to swim and you fall into some water, you might still like try to wave your arms and legs. You know, just like by instinct. So he's he's like flailing his limbs in, in the water. And she's like swimming really well, basically. And now he's going to be able to swim really well. So he starts seeing all these ghosts. They say 21 ghosts. I'm not 100% certain. But certainly some of them, like... Some some of them are the children killed by the the killer that they refer to as the new Jack the Ripper the new Ripper I think they call him and she yeah so so he gets some things that were left to him by her by the old woman and one of them is a key to a like he. The, yeah, this room in the hotel, and right now I don't even remember what was in that room. Um, I mean, that's got to, obviously, something in there helped lead to, was that maybe where she was figuring out, or where someone was supposed to figure out the about the killing, the, the serial killing? And then you have the, yeah, and, you know, he, he encounters one particular ghost named Isabel, who, 
appears to him a bunch of times for the rest of the movie trying to help him uncover the the truth solve the mystery he starts working with the police and they gradually figure out the you know the the killer is a copycat of a serial killer during the 1950s who's called something mace or mace something and it turns out that the killer was actually abducted or kidnapped by the by mace but he he didn't end up getting killed by him but he was there for like two days so he apparently developed some sort of Stockholm syndrome to where he wants to finish Mace's work and yeah the movie ends with us realizing that the that kid was you know grew up to become a, a cop and so he lures the you know he, he manages to take out the other cops after they've realized where the killing where the last killing is gonna gonna happen and then Michael shows up he fights the killer briefly and then the the ghost children show up focus really hard and the killer ends up like partially impaled and I think the idea is supposed to be that the kids managed to push him into the the thing he got impaled by, but it might be that he just got really scared and backed up into it. I'm just, yeah, I'm not sure. I think that is absolutely everything. But, but yeah, the, the, it was definitely, I can, I can understand why Anderson thought that it would be a successful pilot, but I can also understand why it wasn't. And that is it for this video. So if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. I suggest that you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of The Mandalorian that I've personally seen. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend, out, come very, tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoy watching as I enjoy watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.